Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Seabass of WNWS in Jackson, Tennessee. We will talk Vanderbilt football and things related to that topic. Today's show, sponsored by the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water. The Well is a coffee house with a mission to bring clean water to the world. To date, over 30 communities across the globe have access to safe water, health, and hope. You too can make an impact by visiting a Well Coffee House location today. There are four locations to serve you in the Nashville area. Those are in Brentwood, Green Hills, Downtown, and Bellevue. More information can be found at wellcoffeehouse.org, the Well Coffee House where coffee changes lives. We thank our co-sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center, which is located in the Gulch. Today's news presented by Sutherland and Belk, a local injury law firm committed to helping those who've been injured in accidents. If you or someone you know has been in a wreck or other accident, reach out to Sutherland and Belk and see what your rights are. You can find their contact info online at sbinjurylaw.com. A portion of 25th Avenue South has been renamed Perry Wallace Way. The former Vanderbilt Hoops great was the first African-American varsity player in SEC history. Congratulations to Perry Wallace's family. I know that is a great thing, and a lot of folks are happy to see that happen. Our guest line is brought to you by Bowling Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I sleep on Bowling Branch sheets every night. They're amazing. You should try them too. They are fair trade certified. That means they're made under safe conditions by men and women who are treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but you're not going to want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlingbranch.com. That's spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Seabass joins us from WNWS in Jackson, Tennessee. My friend, football season is pretty much on us. I know you're doing high school stuff tonight, and thank you for playing Hurt. Son, I'm hurt too. <laughs> you talk about Hurt. Speaking of Hurt, I just got my MRI results back yesterday, dude. That's what I mean. How about a nice? Uh, yeah, you know our uh, our our medical friends listening today will, will appreciate this. Found out I have a complete tear of my rotator cuff, five point eight centimeters with a five centimeter retraction. Translation: massive, massive mess. <laughs> so I'll be going under the knife. I, I'm finding out next week. I'll be going under the knife and getting this bad boy taken care of. It's going to be a pretty uh, difficult procedure, but, uh, may be down for a little bit. And, and, and the thing that, that, that sucks is it may affect some of my traveling this season. So, uh, I'm afraid I won't, I may not be able to get to all the games, but we'll see. Well, best of luck on that. I know that shoulders bothered you for a long time. A little bit, man, a little bit, brother. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, what's more painful that, or just, uh, had the complete board in the last week or two before football season. Uh, I haven't had time to be bored. <laughs> I mean, we've been we've been working like a dog, but uh, this is you know here here's the thing, Chris. Here's what you need to do. First of all, remember we, we've got college football tomorrow. You know, it's not the doors, but I'm all pumped up about watching this Miami Florida game, especially since our doors play the Gators, but. Uh, I, that's, I think that's going to be enough to get me through to next weekend. And the next weekend, Katie bar the door, all hell breaks loose. It's time to get buck wild. Another college football season will be staring us right in the face. And hopefully thousands upon thousands of us will be making our way to Nash Vegas. Six, what? Six o'clock, six 30 next Saturday night. Six 30 Vanderbilt. We're eight days away. dude. We're eight days away. We're eight days away, Chris Lee. I always look forward for these couple weeks to get over because it just gets so stale. 
And I'm ready for football. I mean, regardless uh, of who they play, the I'm I am I right so. to you. I'm with I'm ready for for this. And I, yeah, even the Florida Miami game will be fun to watch. Yeah, I'm interested in that game. I, you know, I've had a lot of people calling and talking about this game, and it's amazing. I, there's not most people think Miami wins this football game. I'm not really sure why, but they do. I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff going on in Florida right now, and I get all of that. But I mean, I'm not really sure the reasoning for taking Miami in this one. You know, plus they'll be starting a freshman quarterback. But I'm personnel and coach wise, I'm a little more bullish on Florida than I guess most people around here are. Yeah, Florida's been consensus top ten in everything I've seen. I just, I, don't, I don't know where Miami has the advantage here. Uh, I mean, most people keep telling I, I talk to and a couple of people that I really trust. They say. Man, I'm taking Miami. I love Miami. I love Miami in this game. I said, well, I'm not really sure why, other than the potential distractions. But you know what? What's the one? What's the best way to deal with a distraction for a football team, Chris? Probably to play a game. That would be to play football. Absolutely right. Bingo, my friend. That's your release. That's your way out of whatever's going on right there. Uh, whatever's happening in the media, on campus, around the world, uh, none of that matters once you step inside those lines. I like Florida tomorrow. I may be dead wrong, but I like Florida. I think they're going to have a good team this year, uh, and, and we'll see. But uh, the one we're all talking about getting ready for is now eight days away. Vanderbilt, well, I guess – Camp officially over, and we have entered the Georgia prep things as of yesterday. By the way, addendum to the conversation there, AP poll preseason Florida number eight, Miami receiving votes basically 29th. I did not realize Army almost got in the poll with 94 votes was too early. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, they've been a good football team for the last couple of years. Well, just as a fun fact, I did a thing where I was doing the – I took the power rankings for all the services that rank the teams 1 to 130 or 131 or whatever it is, like Lindy's and Athlon's, and Army had the highest variance of any team in Division One in terms of where people put them. So I thought really? that was interesting. Just if you, if you want a little college football fun fact, that is the team in college football where there's the most divergence of opinion around this year. Well, I mean, I mean, and think about it because the sheer amount of teams, you know, it, it, that's always fun to do and, and take a look at. But just by the sheer amount of teams, you're going to get these varying opinions. You know, last week I went and watched uh, the University of Memphis scrimmage here in town, just around the corner from my house. And you know, there's so much chatter about this team and and all this. First of all, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you know, I'm sure a name that a lot of you will remember, Abena Ize. Uh, the young man from Davidson Academy, Chris, I'm sure you remember him, the big lineman. Oh, yeah. Uh, that kind of shocked the world and chose and chose Memphis. Well, he's really filled out his frame. Uh, he looks good. He's got Artis Hicks working on him, a buddy of mine, played for the Tigers in the NFL. Uh, talked to him about him, and Artis really likes him. I think he's got a chance to be pretty good. But I'm watching this football team, and I'm looking at it, and there's all this hype and all this chatter and, and talk about him. You know, and it's true. And I look at this team and some Tiger fans I spoke with think this is the best Tiger team ever. And I'm sitting there looking at this team and I'm, and I'm comparing them to, to Vanderbilt. And I promise you, they play today in a neutral site. I guarantee you I'm taking Vanderbilt in that game. And that may shock a lot of people out there because there's so much talk about the Tigers this year. It's a very pedestrian defense. You know, they're replacing not one, but two phenomenal running backs that are both going to get meaningful playing time in the NFL and one legit pass catcher that I'm pretty confident in along with a, a tight end. I'm, I'm stacking them up against Vanderbilt and I'm looking at the personnel, you know, cause there's been this big conversation and, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to know what you think and what Vanderbilt fans think and the people listening to this podcast about having some kind of uh, I battle of I 40 series type of deal yearly where Vanderbilt and Tennessee and Memphis, obviously Vanderbilt, and Tennessee play each other, but you know, they settle this thing and find out just exactly who is the best team in the state of Tennessee. Cause on this end, everybody says it's Memphis and I watched Memphis play last year. Memphis would not have beaten Auburn. I don't think, I don't think Memphis would have beaten Kentucky and Tennessee beat both of those teams and Vanderbilt beat the crap out of Tennessee. And I know everything's relative and it's one game at a time, 
I would love to know who the best team is, but I will say this to you. I know they're going to get the hype and they'll probably end up with the best record based on conference play, but I don't think it's Memphis. I don't. And I don't think that it's Memphis. If those two teams, if Vanderbilt and Memphis were to play today, I, leaving all allegiances aside, I would take Vanderbilt today. Memphis, by the way, got six votes in the AP poll, which is six more than either Tennessee or Vandy got. So that's what the AP thinks. Yeah, I'm not familiar with their that familiar with their personnel, but I do like the idea of playing a series. Those teams used to play. I know they played a couple times in the 80s. I know Vandy and Memphis, that is. And I think Tennessee and Memphis used to play. I could be wrong. But, yes, I would like that. Uh, you, well, I'll say this. Look, yeah, Memphis used to play both of those teams. I've seen them play both of those teams. The question, though, is, uh, honestly, when it comes like to Vanderbilt and Memphis and in a roundabout way, Van, uh, Tennessee and Memphis, What's the point? Like, what, 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 what's the purpose for for Tennessee to agree to play Memphis or Vanderbilt? Either they're not really recruiting the same players, you know, maybe a couple of them, but the tr- you know, especially for in-state targets, they're not really recruiting the same player. You and I both know that, and I, I, I'd love to see it for the fans' sake. I just don't see where it makes a lot of sense or Tennessee to even entertain the idea of playing that team. Well. I think what might make sense is the fact that it's a road game that fans can travel to, so so there's that. But I think especially for Tennessee, the Vols would probably have more to lose than to gain in that. But that's got me to thinking, a lot of Vanderbilt fans were just overplaying Middle Tennessee State and said they need to drop that game. And now that that's fallen off the schedule and is not on the schedule anytime within the next 10 to 12 years, which is how far out some games have been scheduled. Do you miss that game? (sighs) No, I don't know that so much that I miss it. I mean, I'll say this to you. It agitated the crap out of me when they were losing that game. But once they started winning with a little bit of regularity, and especially in the last couple of times when it became apparent that Vanderbilt's just clearly better than than middle. And I know that one game in, 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 in Murfreesboro came down to the end. But, you know, Vanderbilt's clearly on a, on a different level from middle right now. So beating them is kind of like akin to the Tennessee playing Memphis. Okay, if I beat you, I was supposed to beat you, but I've got everything to lose if I lose, and it could happen. So, I mean, I, I mean I'm, not, I'm not in a big, fat hurry to put middle back on the schedule. I don't really see the necessity for it. And that's another one of those things where, you know, there may be a couple, but generally we're not for the most part recruiting the same players. I like, what about you? Well, here's what I think. I like the novelty of seeing some of these teams that you never get to see. Like I didn't get to see the Nevada game last year because I was watching my nephew play at Missouri I was but I mean I did see it from TV but it's kind of neat to say okay I was in the stadium and saw that game I saw Nevada play once so I missed that one but this year for like for the UNLV game that'll be kind of cool in a way just familiarity with the different program and I guess you get that next year too with Louisiana Tech and Colorado State which by the way Vanderbilt will make a return trip to Colorado State in I think three years, and I'll be making that one, I'm pretty confident, since I've got in-laws 20 minutes from that campus. So that'll be nice. But other than that, like once the novelty that wears off, yes, I would rather have Memphis or, or Middle Tennessee State or somebody like that, Western Kentucky. I think it's more interesting. You know, I was just sitting, while you, while you were talking about it, I was just sitting here trying to think about it, Chris, and you're going to have to help me out. Because I was trying to go over it in my head, and I cannot seem to recall. Because I know uh, that Vanderbilt's going to, and I'm not sure what year it is. You may have it in front of you uh, when Vanderbilt plays Stanford. But can you recall the last time that we played a Pac-12 team? Man, I don't know that it's been in my lifetime. Let Did me we think play about Colorado this. Several years back? Did Not, we play Colorado several years back? I mean, I I'm fairly confident from about seventy eight or seventy nine on that I would remember it. I'm gonna pull up a list of 
of Pac-12 teams here on my phone in a minute and look at it, but I don't remember them playing anybody. Just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. I'm sitting there thinking about it too. That yeah, that is I was crazy. I'm thinking about it too, and of course we played. I can't recall it. I cannot because I'm like you. Mine mine would be you know somewhere in the early '80s too, and I I I I just don't. I mean, maybe in the '80s, probably, but from the especially from like the mid '90s on, when I got done with college and I've been able to focus on it a lot more. I can't remember a Pac-12 game. No, I'm looking at all the teams, and I don't remember Vanderbilt playing any of these at any point in the last 40 years. That is really odd. How is that even possible? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I wonder. I'm thinking... Of course, that'll end with Stanford. Yeah, and I'm thinking of other leagues. I mean, Big 12, you've got Kansas State... You had Baylor in the bowl game last year. I can't think of anybody else in the Big 12 they've played. Uh, no, no, not, not Iowa not State they played head, in the early the 80s. I remember that. And with the ACC, of course, they played Georgia Tech. And they've played, and they played that. Duke. They played NC State. They played Boston they played College. Duke. Yeah. yeah. In the big, in the Big Ten, they, 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 yeah, the Big Ten, they've played Michigan, Northwestern. Uh, they'll go to Purdue this year. So a few of those, but yeah, that's that's weird. No, you would think just by accident they would have played somebody in the Pac-12. I know that that's crazy. I mean, between the two of us, we can't neither one of us figure one of those out. Uh, so I mean, I'm kind of I'm kind of intrigued. When does that Stanford series start? By the way, by the way, two more Big Twelve teams. They played Kansas in the '80s. I remember that, and of course, they played TCU a couple times in the '90s, and then they went there when Jay Cutler was the quarterback. I remember going to TCU and sitting in the press box for one of those games. Uh, my first second year, I did this so. Anyway, what did you just ask me? If I remember correctly, and if I remember correctly, that TCU game was in 1997, if I remember correctly. And TCU was terrible, yeah. TCU was hot garbage. And if I remember correctly, now you got to remember something, Chris. You know, I lived in a fraternity house for three years, so I did a lot of damage. But I want to... That TCU game was either the same night or right in the area of the night that Princess Di passed away. I think you're right. I God, think I you're right. That. that TCU team was absolutely wretched. It had no business losing that game. Not that we were any good, but yeah, yeah. So I'm glad to see us getting involved with the Pac-12, play a couple games there. You know, I. I, I I think I don't know that we need to. I just want to because I'm like you. I like mixing it up a little bit. We know seven or eight teams we're going to see every year. I like to mix it up a little bit. Do you want to talk anything else on Which the schedule or the like year, or do you just want to go to the mailbag at this point? Because I know your time is limited. Yeah, well, I, yeah, it is limited. So I have to go to the mailbag. But here's one question I'd like everybody to ponder, okay, uh, after you listen to this podcast. You could play any team that we don't play annual. I mean, like, don't say Tennessee and stuff like that. We can play anybody. If there's anybody you'd like to play, who would it be? Cause I got That's one a good you. one. Yeah. I, I got I, one let's hear you. yours. Okay. Now, let me say this. It, it, it wouldn't be a, a great... It wouldn't be impossible to beat this team over the last couple of years. In fact, I'd give them a a puncher's chance. Now, having said that, I've also seen this team beat some very, very good teams that are clearly better than Vanderbilt, but I've also seen them play down a little bit. And it's a place where you certainly want to be recruiting wise. It's a, it's a huge, huge name. Uh, it would be a great draw for them coming back here for us. Can you figure out who I'm talking about? Give me the first clue again. 
I don't remember the first thing I said. So uh, I will just say this in the past few years, uh, they would have been very, uh, a game that they definitely, Vanderbilt definitely could have won. Uh, but I'll just say this last year, just last year, this team to beat two teams that Vanderbilt was not going to beat. period. Um, but they also lost a game or two to teams that Vanderbilt absolutely could beat. I'm going to, I'm going to make so a that, wild you know, floor and ceiling. That's pretty yeah. wide. I'll make a wild guess. Southern Cal. No, but that's a very fair guess, and that that team fits into this cat that into all those categories. As a matter of fact, uh, parallel wise, that's about as close as you could possibly get. And the other clue was this is an extremely fertile recruiting ground that we're already taking advantage of, but would have an opportunity to uh, to do even better. You want one more shot at it? Yeah, I'm thinking Texas, but I think that's overshooting the mark. Well, is that your final answer? No, give me one more clue. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, give you one. This makes it very difficult. <laughs> this makes it very difficult. Um, they are west of the Mississippi. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, You'll see why you made this very difficult for me in just a second. <laughs> well, and I, the other thing I was thinking is if I hit too close to the mark and you're thinking UCLA. Is that what you want to stick with? In the interest of time, sure. It was Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you but you made it difficult. You're well, such you a jerk. No. You, you told me no. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said no. So I was like, I said, is this your final answer? And you said, no, give me another guess. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's the Longhorns, Chris. I would love to see them play Texas. You know it is not kind to play Jedi mind tricks on the host, right? I didn't. You said, no, give me another clue. <laughs> so I didn't really know what to do. That's okay. I'll get you back in fantasy football in two so- weekends. Oh, uh, you know what? Before we get to the mailbag, let's just go ahead and do that right now. Let's take care of this right now. First <laughs> of all, I know you saw the projections. We're projected what? A, we play, play each other in week number one. Uh, I think there's what? A point differential in the projections? Yeah, I think you and I are two of the highest three scoring projections in the in the league. So it should be good. Now, I will say this. I was beyond distracted during drive uh, during uh, draft time. I was working, uh, and so I'd have to just hey. I, if we don't win it all this year, that will be the reason why I've got a built-in excuse. The only thing that I will tell you is that you better look out, son, for that combination. All of you in our list better look out for that combination of Jalen Hurts and Lamb. <laughs> I'm going a, I'm to a rack up some frequent flyer miles with that one. You did get my boy. I will say that. I was going to, to take Rondell Moore. Uh, <laughs> I really like him a lot. Uh, and you knew I did. And you, I think you've been messing me, Sam. I'm taking your boy. <laughs> so, well, what can you do? But I happen to believe that, you know, the numbers that Jalen Hurd put up, he may not be too a tongue of Iowa, but i tell you what. He did that against the SEC West. Now he's going up against the Big 12 defenses with with Lincoln Riley calling the plays. I, I think he has a Heisman campaign this year. Legit one. Yeah, I mean, that would be three in a row, which would be crazy. Three years, three quarterbacks. Man. And what, three transfers? Uh, let's see. Well, the, la- the last two were... Yeah, Mayfield transferred from Texas Tech, where he was a walk-on, and they wouldn't give him a scholarship. Boy, how would you? That's right. How'd you like to have that one over again with Kingsbury? Three straight transfers to the same school, three Heisman's. That would be amazing. Okay, so let's do this in the interest of time before we go to the mailbag. Any news and notes that we need to put out there, uh, camp-wise, or now that camp's over, as we are now eight days away. Anything we need to put out there before the mailbag. No, nothing I can come with. It's been such a sensitive 
camp. It, it's it's driven me crazy. Well, and that makes uh, that makes uh, another person because I feel the same way. It, it's almost as if football season's not really here yet, or not really about to start. But you know what I mean? It's like camp hasn't actually started yet because usually, you know, we're able to ascertain pretty much what we've got, or at least what we think we know. This time coming in, and you know, this could either be this could end up being either super fantastic or like uh, uh, killing me here, you know, because the truth is, in a lot of ways, we, I mean. Look, the people listening to this podcast, the people doing this podcast, podcast, we know the personnel, we know the names, we know the positions, but we don't know how they're going to gel together. We don't truly know everything uh, that we could should expect uh, once things kick off in eight days from now. Usually, we generally have a pretty good idea, but man, I'm I've never flown this blind before. May I get on my soapbox for a moment? I, if I tried to stop you, I doubt I could. <laughs> that is correct. I don't know why I asked. <laughs> um, okay, you know, right now, my main side job is editing Blue Ribbon College Basketball Yearbook. In doing some writing, I do the OVC. You want to know what coaches will tell you when you get them on the phone for a private interview in basketball? The ones that I'm dealing with? And, and basically, from the stories I'm editing, this is that way across the board. The answer is everything. They give you a complete scouting report on their team for the most part. In college football, it's like they don't want to tell you anything anymore. And I think it's done more harm than it's done good. Because if you're doing your job, you're going to find it elsewhere, and you're going to end up landing on one of their hills to die on without you knowing it and without them knowing it. And I just don't think that's good. I, I think the restricted information all the way around, all, all it does is it it makes you dig harder for other stuff. And at least when there's communication and stuff like that, and then at least you kind of know, okay, well, they'll give you something off the record and you, you got to hold it for such and such, you know, just as background. But when you can't even get background, everybody's flying blind. I don't think that helps anybody. And I, that's a general statement to this whole thing across the board. I just, it, it is amazing to me that I go out there for practice and, and try to talk and, and, and I spend hours getting nothing. I come home on the phone, I call up an OVC basketball coach, and in 30 minutes I'll get more information about a team than I'll get from entire fall camp of covering. It's just crazy. It's, it's such a difference yeah. in culture. Yeah, and you know, and like I said, uh, you know, it, it's a difference in philosophy. I, as I was I was at that scrimmage last week from Memphis, man. They had the cheerleaders out there. They had face painting, you know, bounce houses and all this other stuff, filled up stands and everything. And it really had that fan base pumped up, you know? I mean, they were just running like scrimmage uh, against each other, but it got them interactive with it. And, you know, it got them part of the thing without truly revealing all that much, uh, but it allowed them to get the, the fans an opportunity to lay eyes on these players uh, and take a look at it and really kind of bolster things up. So I look, Hey, coach Mason forgot more about football than I will ever know by a million miles. It's not even close. And I certainly respect the job that he has and the job that he does. If I were in those shoes, which I'm not, but if I were, I would just have to do it differently. I, I, I don't see the upside for this. It will not make the difference whether or not you beat George. It just won't. It just won't. But it can make the difference in in the interest in your program. And frankly, I mean, that's a big part of it. And that's, you know, let's look, everybody says that, you know, if you win, they'll show up. And to an extent, that's true. But I would point out that James Franklin was often frustrated by the attendance. Would you agree with that? Yeah. But he never had a losing record. Uh, in the in the regular season at Vanderbilt, it, it, what was it? Uh, six wins in the first season, and then I think it's what eight and four and eight and four. I think it was something like that. Eight, nine and three, eight and four, something like that. And still didn't keep that thing filled up. But I think, I, man, I'm telling you, I, I think especially with Malcolm Turner, you can tell some of the stuff they're doing that Malcolm Turner is very serious about getting uh, interactive with this city and this fan base and that's and the student body 
and, and, and making this thing happen. But this, this kind of makes that very difficult to do because it's like, okay, nothing, and then boom, here we are. I, you know, I mean, I, anything I say here is not going to change his mind, and that's fine. But I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I'll be real honest with you. Here's the thing. Now that I've been through it, I've never had an issue with them closing off the last couple of weeks of practice. I get it. You're putting in packages. You're doing specifics. And I know injuries are a sensitive thing over there. But tell us where the line is. You know, just, okay, you can see practice, but here's a couple things. And I I know that as a journalist, you have mixed feelings about going and and seeing something and and then not seeing something quote unquote, because I, you know, I, I, it's like, well then what's the use in being at practice? But I'll give you two examples. If you've covered any practice for any length of time, you already know the day that you go to practice and they're putting in triple option, two point plays, or they've got a tackle eligible catching a touchdown pass, or they've got a halfback option throwing the ball 40 yards down the field for completion. You already know those things are off limits. Like, if you go and write that stuff, like, you only do that unless you don't know what you're doing. So that's kind of the understood culture already, okay? I went to a practice. I won't give you the year, the person, the sport, but I had a pretty good relationship with this coaching staff. And it's a week or two before the season, and there's superstars on the sidelines during practice. And the media relations guy just looks over at me and says, hey, just for today, can you pretend you didn't see that? And did I feel a little bit weird at first? Yeah. But after about five seconds of thought, I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, these guys have been pretty good to me. I'm a guest in their building. I don't get that asked of me that often. So sure. Uh, I know it's a big deal. I know it could affect things. I get it. You make little trade-offs like that every now and then in the business. Um, again, they're they're not necessarily your proudest moments as a journalist, so to speak, but you always try to have the long haul in mind. And I think if if you just had understanding of this, that, and whatever, and you the ground rules, I don't think that opening a couple of weeks of camp for the most part and allowing people to get background hurt you, and I think it probably helps you more than it does hurt you, because I think the restrictiveness of information and trying to hide things, it, it ends up, eventually, if, if somebody's trying to do his job, the toothpaste will come out of the tube sideways, and then nobody's happy with that. Right, agreed, yeah. I just, I, it just is a weird feeling going into this game. I mean, like I said, you and I, I'm clearly, we both know the personnel, <laughs> and anybody on the, that listens to this podcast and, and and is on the board knows the personnel. And I just, I would just like to see a, a, at least a little more access to this team. I mean, I feel like I know more about other teams than I do my own. I'm not feeling that way. Now, th- there are some teams that are going to be that way, and, and, and it works well for them. But when you're a team who's, struggling to put your own fans teams in the seats. We can, we're real good at bringing in other fans. You know, we're freaking best in the country at it, but when we're trying to build our brand and, 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 you know, really get the city of Nashville and middle Tennessee involved with things, this makes it that much harder to do because all of a sudden it's like, Oh, football season's here. Well, as the average pretty decent football fan who, you know, get them to name five starters on the defensive side of the ball and name town, name three, I'll have them name two. And they're probably not going to be able to do it. They're well, probably not going to be able to do it. The, the upshot of this was there was a board. There was a thread on our message board this week. One day that probably at one point got more traction than any other one. It was about a Cheryl Crow concert at Lipscomb Academy, and like, boy, if that's not a sign of the times, then what is? Um, I mean, you know, and you know how I feel about that type of stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I'm there for the sports, but, and and I get there's a second, but if if we had a little more access and knew the kind of things that were going on at camp, 
that may not get the play. Of course, maybe it does. You never know. Sometimes threads like, you know, hey, y'all, I'm going to Miami. Where's a good place to eat? End up with 60, pre- 60 posts on it. And, and that happens whether camp's open or not. But, yeah, your, your point's valid because what you have to do is say, okay, if this thread is in College Station, you know, if this thread is in Gainesville, does it get more than one or two answers? Nah, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any interest in stuff like that. But, you know, I, I think the lack of information, certainly not any due to you, anything you're doing wrong. Uh, you know, just we're focusing on other stuff now because they're just not going to give us anything. Yeah, I, I think I think when you try to limit free speech to an extreme direction, it usually ends up having the opposite effect. Yeah, plus we got to remember there's what I mean. How many people cover this SEC program? By the way, about three of you. Yeah, I mean, it, free speech was the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Okay, well here yeah, here's the media. The only guy who covers them who is at his full-time job to do that with nothing else is Adam Sparks. There are other us who cover them, but we're all either people at TV stations or papers with other things to do, um, or, or me or, or some other guys that run some sites. Like, I, you know, I have several other freelance things to do. I know one of my major competitors has has the same thing. So it just it's like that's the other thing is like our time is limited in the first place. So when your time is is when you've got a window where you got to do other things to make a living and and the the access window that you have is not very productive, you got to make choices too about how you spend your time. And if that includes just sitting out practice because it's it's not even worth the gas to come up there, then I think that's a consequence that doesn't help them either. I agree, and I've never heard a better segue in my life than the, to the mailbag than what you just said. <laughs> Speaking of consequences of time. Yeah, well, let's go. Our mailbag is sponsored by Vanderbilt Fan and independent insurance agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. Do you need an insurance agent who wants to know your unique needs and circumstances and will tailor an insurance plan to fit them? Josh is your guy. Call him 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash JD Minton HQ. He's my agent. Give him a shot. I think you'll be pleased. Vandy Gal 78 says, while we most likely lose to Georgia, what would you like to see from the game that would indicate some positives for the rest of the season? Man, uh, I mean, obviously, I'd love to win this game, but man, I would love to see a return to some of those games where we take these suckers down to the wire and and we don't lose it because of ineptitude on either side of the ball. We lose it because they're just at the end of the day, they're better. You know, but that they've been in a dog fight on both sides of the ball, and they know it. You know, I, I don't want it to be one of those things where, you know, the defense shows up, but we can't move the football or the offense. The same thing with like Baylor. As fun as it was to watch our, uh, our offense run up and down the field, remember how miserable that game was? I don't want anything like that. I, I want on both sides of the ball, go in there swinging like Gotti and Ward. And at the end of the day, if we don't have more points, it's just because they're better than we are. And they're a top three or four team in the country. Uh, but it wasn't because of some ineptitude on our part. I keep waiting for it to come out that the Texas Bowl wasn't really just a bowl game, but it was some kind of a video game simulation. Yeah, that that was not a – that. I mean, even when we had the ball and we're gashing them, I mean, it wasn't – I don't like football where you, you 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 snap the football and there's nobody on an entire side of the field and people are just running unchecked. That's that's not football to me. Vandy Doors 04 says, if you had a say, what is one scheme or philosophy you would change in Vanderbilt's offense, defense, or special teams? Says, example, move to run pass option, shift to 4-3, or bring back the rugby kicks. He says he's just kidding on the latter one. Okay, man, that was going to be the first thing I addressed was that rugby kick. I don't ever want to see that again on my team. Not ever. I don't care if they're the best rugby kicker on the planet. I don't like it. Um, the And what was it? What schemes would we ch- would I change yeah. on, on offense or defense? I really I, – I really 
obviously would love to see the screen game a little bit more used effectively. I think we've got the, the personnel to do it. And there's been, I know there's been times over the last couple of years where you think, man, a screen, you know, isolation, in, in, you know, in the open field uh, would just be absolutely fantastic right here. And I just, you know, there was a, there was a time at one time we ran it when it was completely obvious, then we'd just go away from it totally and they'd never see it. Then we'd see it at flashes the last couple of years, have success. It's like you wouldn't see it anymore. Uh, I, I would like to see that implemented a little bit more. Uh, defensively, you know, defensively, Chris, it's, it's not so much that I've had these monster issues with scheme is, it's just that it's, it's been personnel. I mean, we've been getting beating up, beaten up at the point of attack so badly that it just really takes everybody else, uh, out of their game. So I could come on here and say more edge pressure, you know, something like that. You know, I don't know, four, two, five. Well, whatever you want to do, I don't even know that I have an overly huge issue with with scheme uh, defensively as 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 I do just the lack of effective personnel over the last couple of years. What about you? Um, I would like to see them go more up tempo when it suits them. I don't know if that exactly hits the question. Uh, the RPO is always something I've liked if you've got the personnel to run it. I mean, the 4-3 the I always thought was a bad idea. We'll see how that goes now as they've got more good defensive linemen in. Maybe that will change. But, I mean, I hey, now that I think about it, a lot of stuff about their schemes, I, I would have changed in the recent past. But, anyway... I mean, yeah, and, and all, all that predi- all that yeah. predicates what you have too. And so there's some cases where I thought right. that they had talent to to do or not do some of those things. Like an RPO with Kyle Shermer was not going to work with with Riley Neal or Deuce Wallace. It might, but anyway. And but you know, all that defensive front, you know, I've seen three four defenses be very effective. I've seen Derek Mason def- defenses be very effective at the three four. Of course, mainly that was out the West Coast, but I don't know, man. I, I just it's what I was raised on that that four that that forty three. It's what I'm used to, uh, but I, I think it's highly predicated on personnel, like you said. Last two questions. Uh... Conluck says, what's your go-to pregame meal? And then Vandy Gal 78 follows with, what is your go-to pregame drink? P.S. My husband and I would love to buy you a drink sometime. Okay, well, let's go with the first one. Who was it, Conluck? Correct. Uh, Conluck, I have a tradition. Uh, I, I go to, uh, to the game with, a, uh, with two buddies of mine, uh, and we pretty much do the same thing every time over the last couple of years. And the first recommendation came from Chris Lee. Uh, he's the one that, that turned me on to it. Uh, but what we do is we come in and, and, and I'm, I'm going to change things up a little bit this year. I'm going to try to do some, I haven't, Chris, I'm a little bit ashamed of myself before I answer this question. I just have, I've never really been a bandy tailgater. In all my years, I mean, I've, I've went to, I've you know, hung out with you a little bit, and Mitch, and and seen some other folks, but I've never just flat out tailgated up there, you know, hung out a couple hours before the game, throwing the ball around, cooking, doing all this other stuff, watching other games, you know. And I need to change that, you know. I'm, I need to hang out with some folks this year and and do that. But our tradition has been over the last few years is we uh we head over to what is it, Chris, twenty first. Avenue and we go to Satco. We, we start off at Satco uh, and I'll get me a couple of fish tacos. Uh, and then, I mean, I, I, the best thing that I've ever tasted in my life. Uh, then we head over, we go straight from Satco, but I, eat, I try to eat light because I got to save my, my, I got to save something in the stomach uh, for two scoops of Jenny's ice cream on a hot waffle cone. One scoop, the bottom scoop is going to be, uh, cream puff. The top scoop is going to be gooey butter cake. What if you get the top and the bottom mixed up? Does and that ruin it for you? No, no. I probably wouldn't know the difference. To be honest with you, it's just the way I've always done <laughs> it. Was it was just funny the way um, you put it. Yeah, because I always tell them. Well, I always tell them cream puff first, so they put it on the bottom. Um, 
And then the other question was my favorite drink. Uh, I think it was Vandy Gal. Not the biggest drinker you ever seen in your life. Don't really drink. Well, I don't drink beer at all. Uh, but I will drink a mixed drink every now and then. Uh, my favorite would have to be, well, no, my favorite is, is one that I would never tailgate drink. And I'm ashamed to say it because Chris, I'm a man, but I'm no rot gut drinker. I don't drink like Jack Daniels and stuff like that. Um, my favorite drink, believe it or not. Oh, I don't even want to say this, Chris. God is a grasshopper. (laughs) But, uh, if I were to have somebody buy me a drink, it would have to be, uh, I'm kind of like the dude, Chris. You remember what the dude drank? Oh, I should know. And, and I've, I've blanked. Oh, shame, Chris. The dude loved a good white Russian. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Love, he loved the white Russian. So, yes, uh, I'd love, love to meet you guys. And uh, if you wanted to buy me a drink, I would have a white Russian. You're not a lot. I don't really drink. I don't like the taste of beer at all. And I just the way that I'm wired, I, I don't like I don't like bitter tasting things. I like sweet things and ice yeah. cream and stuff. I I just think it's a it's a difference in it, it's weird because I've got a brother who loves beer. Uh, and I I just can't stand it. And like we have the same genes and everything, but you're not alone. Well, I think for me, Chris. Uh, college took that out of me. I had a funnel called the funnel of love and, uh, and, and spent many a nights with a, with a 12 pack of nat light ice and a funnel with me and my buddies. And that just kind of wore me out. So I'm um, for, for the last 20, 25 years, I just really haven't drank any beer, man. I just, I I've lost the taste for it completely. Uh, so, you know, I know all the, I see all these people standing in line, you know, missing games to get a beer, and stuff like that. And I'm saying, this tastes that good that you want to miss the game for this? And by the way, before we get out of here on that, uh, speaking of that, your thoughts on the fact that Vanderbilt's going to be selling alcohol at the games this year? Well, first of all, I think a podcast about the, the funnel of love might have been more interesting than <laughs> than talking a lot of fall camp this August. Uh, then <laughs> <laughs> the funnel of love. Although I wonder how much I would have, I would have, how much of that would I have had to have edited out <laughs> had we done that? Oh, Chris, you know we're boys and all that, but I mean, <laughs> uh, you're not ready for those. <laughs> you're not ready for that. <laughs> the funnel of love. Who made that up? <laughs> I did. I had it. I wrote it in glue, and I have wrote it in glue. And then my girlfriend uh, sprinkled <laughs> glitter all over it, and it just said "funnel of love" right there on do, the tube. Do you Beautiful. still do you still have the funnel of love? It lasted longer than the girlfriend, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would not be able to tell you where that is, or if it's even on Earth anymore. <laughs> so I have no idea. I would I would pay you. Uh, if you could tweet a picture out of that, but anyway, oh, if I, you know, if one of my brothers has uh, had a picture of that and I could find that, I'd get it to you. That would be, that would be a trip down memory lane worth taking. Did your days in any way resemble uh, old school? My last semester did. I went ahead and shut it on down <laughs> and just became a professional. Um, recreational enthusiast. I mean, that can be the best way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So, I mean, they were insane, uh, but yeah, something close to that. I mean, look, as a 46 year old right now, you asked me, would I go back in time and do a lot of that? Definitely. Yeah, sure. Why not? I have a different mindset, but at the time it just seemed like the thing to do. Well, and the funny thing is that people don't know this. You were like one of the most brilliant from your mama people I've ever met, but it's just, I, I think I'm going <laughs> to really, go to, go really to sleep. I trying to get the mama. funnel of love out of my, my head. Like what, what did Bill, Bill Cosby say one time in his stand up routine? Not that I like referencing the guy, but I love the statement. He said, it takes brilliance to fake such stupidity. And with that, I think we should end the show today. <laughs> yes, man. I got to go to work. Tell people where they can find your show online, where they can follow you on Twitter. 
Man, you can you can find me online at WNWS.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Cheap Seats Bass. Guys, we are eight days out. Man, let's go. Let's represent. Man, nobody in the world gives, you know, outside of us cares a thing in the world about this program. Nobody's giving us a shot Saturday. Maybe we don't have one. I don't know. But, man, I, I'm, I'm just ready. Derek Mason really feels good about this team. We were able to convince three legit NFL players to come back, and they're on the offensive side of the ball, and they're not linemen. Three skilled players that are legit NFL players, for sure, maybe more with some of the youngsters. There's a chance for this to be a really good season. Let's do something different. Get off your fat booties and go to the ball games. If you live in the Middle Tennessee area, if you live in Nashville, don't sit there and watch it at home, man. So you got to be the difference. Now, I get to as many games as I possibly can. I live outside of the area, but I'm talking to myself too. If there's a game when I think, ah, it's just UNLV, no. We get seven of these a year. Let's do this, man. Let's do something special. Nobody believes in this program. Nobody cares about this program, but we do. And all it takes is just a couple of these bad boys and guys like Malcolm Turner, who I am convinced we made the right hire, Chris. And he has a vision. I believe in it. I believe in him. I'm ready to do something transcendent, man. Let's make this happen. Anchor the bleep down and let's do this. Be good and stay away from the funnel of love. Thank you for listening. We'll see you again very soon.